this year for the fifth annual Women in Media Conference, attendees had the pleasure of hearing from the renowned poet, activist, and scholar Sonia Sanchez, who served as a keynote speaker for this event. And we as a people, you know, people laugh at Trump, you can laugh all you want to, laugh, but organize. Yeah. Laugh and organize so he doesn't get reelected. That is a dangerous man, you know. When you look at him and you understand the one percent, the one percent that put him in power, okay, whatever, fascism is looking at in the eyes. And the people who will end up really in a sorry condition will be black and Puerto Rican, black and brown people, and working class whites who have not recognized what has happened to them yet in this country. Because what America says, you might be poor, but you're white. Isn't it amazing that you would say that? You might be poor, but you're white. Isn't that something? It's about time that we began to look at each other and said, we need to really come together and work together. I just, and so King says, from now on, he said, I choose to identify with the underprivileged. I choose to identify with the poor. I choose to live for and with those who find themselves seeing life as a long and desolate corridor with no exit sound. That is the way I'm going. If it means suffering a bit, I'm going that way. If it means sacrificing, I'm going that way. I'm going that way because I heard a voice saying, do something. He said, there are 40 million poor people here. We must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? When you begin to ask that question, you are raising questions about the economic system, about the broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. I am simply saying that more and more, we've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. We are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day, we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. I say it again that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. You see, my friends, for others. Um, I heard we must recognize that we cannot solve our problems now until there is a radical redistribution of economic and political power. Integration must be seen not merely in aesthetic or romantic terms. It must be seen in political terms. Integration in its true dimension is shared power. That's all it is, people. Shared power. shared power. If someone says, well, integration is that you're going to go move in a white area, and we were fooled in New York core, so we took our kids out of schools and put them up in the Bronx, put them up in the schools, and years later, our children said, you know, no one ever talked to us. We put our children in alien, alien territory. And no one ever talked to us, no one ever asked our questions, we raised our hands, you know, we ate by ourselves also too, and they were too scared to tell their parents because everyone has said, this is the thing to do. Take your children out of your neighborhood and plot, plot them down someplace, whatever. And that's what happened to a generation of children. And then I heard the morning northern thunder, Malcolm, and his voice sent me out looking for myself and to the Schaumburgs of the world, and I found Robeson, Du Bois, Delaney's Blake of the Hearts of America. And I was no longer afraid of Malcolm, because he was part of a continuum, he and Martin. And I found Chestnut, Wheatley, Jean, Tuma, Langston, Hughes, Frederick Douglass, Claude McKay, Ida Wells Barnett, and Spencer, Garvey, Brown, Sterling, and William Wells, David Walker, Margaret Walker, John Brown, W. Randall, William Brooks, Arthur Davis, and Malcolm set my eyes overseas to Gugua, Thiongo, Fidel, Chino Achebe, and Yere, Chairman Mao, and Kuma, Lumumba, C.L.R. James, Gillian, and Neruda. Malcolm said, the problem facing our people in America is bigger than other personal or organizational differences. Therefore, as leaders, we will stop worrying about the threat that we seem to think we pose to each other's personal prestige and concentrate our united efforts to solving the unending hurt, exploitation that is being done daily to our people by America. It doesn't matter who's the largest supposed minority must fight this divisive mind by our communities, in the prisons, in our schools, and our streets. He said we must expand the civil rights struggle to a higher level, to the level of human rights. Whenever you are in a civil rights struggle, whether you know it or not, you are confining yourself to the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam, 
we expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights, you can take the case of black men, old women, in this country before the nations of the UN, before a world court. But you can't do it only at the level of human rights. Civil rights keeps you in his pocket. Civil rights means you're asking Uncle Sam to treat you right. Human rights are something you are born with. And I made an amazing discovery. When you go searching for your identity, when you write about your people and your struggle, when you begin a journey of identity and liberation, you find yourself and others who have been vanished too, or who have also hidden their eyes from themselves. And as I helped found Black Studies in San Francisco in the mid-1960s, I found for my two Japanese American students information about concentration camp signs asking Japanese people to deport at a certain time and date. And they went home and asked their parents, I just have to say, I said to the class, run into my class, you were teaching and you were researching at the same time. You have no idea that when we decided to say we're going to take over universities, I mean, you know, you're talking about a rush. It's better than making love, people. Okay? You know? You're talking about a rush. The tingling in your toes, in your feet, in your heart, you know. You're talking about going into a university saying, we is here, yeah. you know, and we're going to start something called Black Studies, right? Yeah. You know, and Reagan literally had to come in and put in a new president because he was against what we were doing. That's what Reagan did, because he was, he was what, governor of California. And I stood up on stage and said, imagine poor California having this man as governor, right? I said, you know, I said, there's something wrong that a state would make him governor and years later became president. So there was something wrong with the whole bloody place. That would be. <laughs> but I helped, I helped found black studies. And as I was rushing to my classroom, someone said, here's Sonia. This is about concentration camps. So I got at my desk, put my books down, and I began to read it, and there's a photo, a picture. So I held it up, and I talked directly to my two Japanese Americans. So they said, it seems like there was something called concentration camps in, in America. I said, have you heard anything about it? Now, when you teach sometimes, you can make awful mistakes, you know, by saying things in that way, right? They got pissed at me. They said, we've never heard of any detention camps, whatever, and our parents had never told us anything. So I said, okay, let it go. Put it down on the desk. We started the class. Those who were studying with me know at the end of my classes, I, we hold hands. We make a circle, a circle where we look at each other and be connected with each other. And in that circle, <laughs> one of the Japanese Americans tried to drop my hand. I kept grabbing her hand. <laughs> and as they left, I said, here, take it home. Just ask your parents, right? They came back to class on Tuesday morning with tears in their eyes. They had asked their parents, you know, about concentration camps, and their parents had been in concentration camps, you know, in a place called America. So when you go searching for yourself, for your own identity, you will find others. But their history and history has been hidden, you know. But I was in a place um, in, the mid, uh, in the far west, uh, Seattle. And I finished speaking to about some conference, 5,000 people looking at me. But I saw this young Japanese American young woman running down the aisles. And she ran up on stage and she said, It's me, <laughs> Professor Sanchez. You know, you teach 40 some odd years, you find a student every place on the planet Earth. Even in the southern part of France, when you've gone in for a vacation or whatever, you know, they jump off a train and say, Professor Sanchez, right? Whoa. Uh, she said, did you see the documentary? And I said, the documentary on the concentration. And she said, I did that. Wow. Wow. You got to know why you're put on this earth, people. You're put on this earth to make sure the change will occur. You're put on this earth to come up against people who have tons of money, right? But I'm talking about people. People with hearts, people with ideas about the world, people who decided that this world is going to survive in spite of people now who have so much money and they figure the earth is so ruined, they're going to go to the moon one way. And I'd like to help them get there as fast as they can get there. Right? <laughs> so we can begin to repair this earth. We need to begin to repair Mother Earth. Make no mistake about it. But Japanese Americans were sick because people thought of them not as American. <clears throat> not loyal, loyal, strange buns, 
probably only loyal to Japan, though they were American citizens. There's not one example of a Japanese American doing anything, you know, uh, uh, you know I'm serious, you mean, at all. And they fought in that war. And I, uh, as I taught, I found Native Americans. I found the Long March, Wounded Knee, City Bull, Geronimo, and every treaty made with Native Americans had been broken. I found Chief Seattle who said, these shores were swamped and this were dead of my tribe. He, be just and deal kindly with Indian people, for the dead are not powerless. Dead, did I, I say. There is no death, only a change of world. I found Chinese men and women secreted in the creases of America. Chinese men building railroads, banging dynamite in mountains and exploding in western yellows, dying alone, working in the laundry rooms of America, ironing white sheets, shirts with heavy eyes, asking my yellow bang, almond eye sister, you Chinese, you Chinese. I found Chicanos portrayed as lazy, sleepy underneath movie sombreros. Si, senor, si, senor. I get up soon, Petro, and I do that work for you. E, e, e. I just need a little siesta. Si, senor, si, senor. Me not work too hard, but Conchita, she do enough work for the two of us. E, e, e. I found concentration camps with Jews and gypsies and others stretched out along a funeral plain, moving in the rain of ash on rambling mines. I found Puerto Ricans alienated from their homeland, found some asking for independence in the hallway of Congress, found them not learning Spanish because their parents wanted them to be good Americans. I met gays and lesbians coming out in the streets of America, taking over San Francisco politics until a strange illness curtailed their actions for a decade. I found Bernard Haring, a Roman Catholic teacher, who said we must stop the materialistic growth mania for more and more productions and more and more markets for selling unnecessary and even damaging products. It is a sin against the generations to come. What shall we leave them? Rubbish, atomic weapons, numerous enough to make the world uninhabitable, a poison atmosphere and polluted water. So to be a black woman, poet, mother, professor, activist, to write and teach about social justice, peace, freedom, sexual justice, economic justice, to teach your students not to compete, but to, not to compete, but to compete in this process called learning together, to have group exams where students learn how to study together, help each other, and learn not to compete, to take your students outside the university to public schools, neighborhoods, and to the Schomburgs of America, to high schools, community centers, and to prisons to teach and learn. When you take your writing classes outside in the fall and spring to listen to the leaves and flowers and grass turning over in beauty and conversation, when you teach them to be quiet and listen, to be mindful of themselves, and therefore to be not mindful of the nature of themselves. I began to teach and originate new words for the classroom, diarchy, not a matriarchy or patriarch system. And you know, the great thing about teaching is that you have to come up with new stuff. You got a book, got all this black lip, but you know, they're not saying, no one's written criticism on it, right? So you read a book called Clotel, and years later, the bluest eye, right? And you read these books at some particular point, and there are connective threads there at some particular point, right? And so one of the themes in this first, I, I taught the first course on the black woman in America at the place called the University of Pitt. It's, a, it's amazing. And not because I was so bright and came up with it, my students, you know, all these black women on college campuses at U Pitt, they were struggling. They were dying on campus, and they would hang out in my office until 8 p.m. and just, I gotta go home, you know, whatever, you know. I gotta go home to my children, right? And I said offhandedly, sometimes I think we need a course on us. Never, ever say anything to young students like that. The next morning, I show up at 8 o'clock, you know, for my 8.40 class, and there are, there's a line of 15 students down the hallway, uh, just standing, they said, you're right, Professor Sanchez, we do need a course, and you need to teach a course. You know, and I said, well, you do know that you know, we're on the quarter system here, and my classes are already scheduled for the next quarter. They said, yes, and, 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 and I said, I guess you want to call this the black woman, right? And they said, yeah, that's a good name, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, try it. So I sent up to the powers that be a possibility of a course. Right? They said it right back two hours later. We've never had a course called the Black Woman at the University, right? And what would you teach? Whatever. Sit up, 
the books, whatever, you know, and then, okay, and what would be the outline? And he said it back, by the end of the day, they said, okay, this is it. So then I had to add a course, you know, to my teaching, you know, in the next. When I showed up, I figured all women would be, that the 15 women, I showed up to a class of about 30 women, but almost 30 men. I went, whoa. You know, I knew trouble. <laughs> trouble was going to be happening there that day, right? And in the back were four administrators with a yellow pad and a pen, right? I was a young, young teacher, you know what I mean? So I never moved from my desk. I had all my notes. I passed up out the syllabus, right? We went over the syllabus. It was a perfect syllabus, people, you know, because I had worked very hard on this perfect syllabus, right, you know, with all the books they were to get, right. And as I finished, you know, whatever, you know, it was really fine. We started the course. And about the second week, this young sister stood up and said, I hate all men. <laughs> and I went to my syllabus, and there was nothing here that said, I hate all men. So what do you do? You're a teacher, people. You don't stand there in a the state of stasis, you know, and don't move. I got up and went around because she stood and hugged her. And the whole class hugged her because she, she was talking about uh, what had happened to her. Can anyone imagine what it was? Anyone? Not great, but incest, you know. And I came back and wrote in the margin, incest, go to the library. That's mm -hmm. all I said. But we also hugged her and her tears and we let her talk. And then she came to my, my office and we also got help. But I had to deal with something called incest. But I had, it's no place in here for incest. No, matriarchy, patriarchy, you name it, whatever, et cetera. Slavery, what it was to be said, a new name for that, all that kind of stuff. And I had to go then and live in the library that weekend in order to bring to them the reality of what that was about. That happened. And of course, the brothers in the class went, see, we told you so. It's going to be a class, right, where they talk about us, <laughs> right, right, okay. We got over that hump, right, you know, and we're moving on, and the, 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 the people from the dean's office and principal, they're still writing in that yellow pad. They filled up a whole yellow pad by then, right? I am still a nervous young professor, right? And then the brother stood up and said, I hate all black women. <laughs> You know, and I'm thinking, why did you start teaching this course, Sonia, right? We got up, we hugged the brother, you know, and he talked about like how his grandmother who was raising him wouldn't let him go out at night and blah, 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 but he's a man and whatever, et cetera. And we discussed that, but, and he said, and it's because of what you have on your, on your um, syllabus. It's the matriarchy, because at that time, I can't think of the, of the man's name who put out that, um, the Kerner report. It said that the reason, the problem with the black family was the black woman. You should go back and reread that, okay? Um, and there it was, right? So I went home that night, and I was like, you know, I went to bed. I need to go to bed. I need to go to sleep. I needed to rest. My head was... And I woke up in the middle of the night with a word, diarchy. Diarchy. I got up, went down the hallway, opened my big dictionary, and looked it up. I said, I oh, think, you know, you get sleep, the mind still wanders, the mind still works for you, the mind still does work right. So I came into the classroom when we were on patriarchy and wrote patriarchy, matriarchy, and down the middle, diarchy, whatever. Because basically that is what African Americans have been in this place called America. They would be in a diarchy, you know. I mean, we did not have power, you know, but, but patriarchy, because saying patriarchy pretends power. Matriarchy pretends power for that woman. But in this country, the way they did us in terms of how you live, the schools, you no know, jobs, whatever, whatever. It was a diopolis system. And so I began to teach that also. I began to teach and originate new words for the classroom, diarchy, not a matriarchy and patriarch system. You know, for many black families, many involved in a diarchy, uh, two people in the house, a grandmother and a mother, two aunts and a child, a mother, uncle, and children, a family system functioning <coughs> under duress. I had to understand Douglas' statement, I thank God for making me a man, and Martin Delaney in 1859 who said, I thank God for making me a black man, to teach or explain the new double consciousness we read in Vincent Harding's There is a River, and the tension of an African identity, 
and a struggle for freedom at home, immigration and struggle at home, to see in Melville's Benito Serino that Babo and Captain Delano, De Delano are the national double consciousness of this country. And in the modern day society, we see the secondary consciousness, a word that I coined in the late 1960s, the emergence of black women who develop a secondary consciousness about family and themselves. So from hotel to the bluest eye, Pauline Breedlove in the bluest eye, and Charlie, her husband, you know, and the Fisher family, that she would look at the Fisher family <coughs> as the ideal family, right? And black women, Tony Morris in that brilliant book began to show us how black women began to look at themselves secondarily through the eyes, through the eyes, through the eyes of other women. So you go, come to a Peter Parlor and Gwendolyn Brooks write about it, and a black woman said, give me an upspeak, just like Jane Harlow. <laughs> well, you, you ain't Jane Harlow. <laughs> But we began to look secondary, and then, but the deeper thing that Morrison and the early lit writes about too, and when I taught it, I could never, I struggled with what it meant. You know how you, you read and you're not sure what it means, and then you began to break it down, and in that literature, you began to see black women from the very beginning, from the enslavement, began to look at black men secondarily through the eyes of the slave master. You knew. You knew that the person in charge was not your so-called husband. You knew that you could be taken away from your husband. You know, your children could be taken away. So we began to look secondarily. So I am, we pushed one of the sisters. She's graduating from the, one of the most prestigious colleges, universities in America. She's getting a PhD, one of the first black women get a PhD. And my telephone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning. I go, oh, you know. And she said, she was crying. I said, Professor Sanchez. I'm walking and graduating tomorrow. I said, yes, I sent you a gift. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. She says, yes, but my advisor, who was a male, says, well, you might be getting the degree, but you don't have a man. So I said, my dear sister, we promised you a PhD degree, but we did not promise you a man. You know? I said, we didn't promise no men. Okay? So therefore, you go to sleep. You march down, come to Philadelphia, right? I'll feed you, talk to you, and do what my grandma needs to do. Come here over here, girl, let me shake some sense to you. You know, because what he finally said to her was to make her feel terrible because she was getting this degree. Can you imagine that? No. So we began to look secondarily at the, through the eyes of the slave master. Read the bluest eye and understand that this woman will go to work and she becomes a human being in the house as a servant, not in her own house with her husband, with her children. Isn't that amazing? So she becomes a human being. The rugs are so wonderful that her, her sore foot does a flip-flop. You're right. She can comb the little blonde girl's hair, and she doesn't have to go, oh, 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 like she does with her own child. She becomes the human being as the perfect servant. Isn't that amazing? You have to really understand at some times, you know, what this thing called racism has done to us as a people, mentally. This will lead you on a journey to the discovery of self where you find others hiding out also. And you extend your hand tentatively and say, you must be the brother. You must be the sister they never told me about. Hola, bonjour, ni hao, salam alaikum, shalom, hotel, namaste. Buenos dias, abaragani. Hey, how you be? What up? What's happening? Walking upright in the 21st century towards the light that was, is Brother Malcolm, Brother Martin, Brother Medgar, Brother Nkuma, Brother Mandela, Brother Paul Robeson, Brother Baraka, Brother Malabudi, Brother John Brown, Brother Hao Zin, Brother Karinga, and Sister Rosa Parks, Sister Fannie Hamer, Sister Ella Baker, Brother James Baldwin, uh, Sister Kay Boyle, Sister Angela Davis, Sister June Jordan, Sister Audrey Lord, Sister Winnie Mandela, uh, Sister Tony Morrison, Sister Yuri Kochiyama, Sister Grace Boggs, uh, Sister Arjun Rich, Brother John Henry Clark, Sister Alice Walker, uh, Sister Bernice Reagan, Sister Dorothy Height, Sister Gwen Brooks, Sister Margaret Walker, Rainbow Warriors, Walking, Teaching Social and Sexual Justice and Peace, Making It Better 
for us all, and it'll get better for us in three words. eBay, 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 eBay. We have a, a new award that we're giving out for the first time because this is year number five. So this can't be like all the previous years. And we would not be here without the support of our community and our partners, our sponsors, our media, and you. We have students who are here, we have authors who are here. But Philly Cam has been with Women in Media since our second annual conference. Our first conference started out at Temple University. It was a vision that I got after attending a film festival. It was a film screening. The film was about Philadelphia's art scene. I'm a young professional, so I wanted to support my peers. I'm an artist, so it was about art. And of course, media. So it was three reasons for me to attend. I went to this film screening and I left disappointed because the narrative was not true. They had one woman represented in that film for Philadelphia's art scene, and they planned to shop this film around the world. Now, I'm not sure what happened five years later with this film, but something didn't sit right in my spirit after I left, and I couldn't leave it alone. And I wanted to do something to empower women to own their voices, because not only did they only have one woman represented in that film, when I think about Philadelphia's art scene, I think about performance artists, I think about dancers, vocalists, musicians, and they had a DJ, we're known for our DJs, but we have so much art, and it was not in that film. And I couldn't celebrate it, I couldn't leave it alone, and I was double offended, I had just got back home from Spelman College, and it was Women's Month. You are not about to disrespect us during Women's Month, you know? So I called Kendra, my best friend, and I called some other young ladies, and I said, let's do something, let's get together and do something. Temple was on board, and we did that from like nothing. You know, I was still living at home with my mom. She donated decorations. I called Chick-fil-A, we need some chicken. I called, you know, all the women I knew. Deanna Williams came out, East Stephen Collins came out, Sharon Powley came out. So many people were represented, and they came out. NBC 10 came out, MTV came out, and we were, I was 23 at the time, and everything came together. And now, here we are, five years later, we are still here, and Philly Kim has joined us since the second year. So if we can have our Philly Kim family come up. We are proud to honor Philly Kim for her dedication to the community, for her dedication to media. about the history, but they fought, you know, the community came together for 20 something years to make sure that we had a community access channel. I love talk radio. And now Philly Cam has a talk radio show. Each year they come out, Antoine that's at Philly Cam is my Morehouse brother. I called him, I said, we're related, I need your help. And he said, whatever we can do, we're there. And so we just want to honor Philly Cam for their leadership in the media and what you guys do for advocacy, for, for, for leadership, for women, and most importantly, how you support women in media. We could not do this without you all. So we have a brand new award named Just for Philly Cam, the 2017 Advocacy and Leadership Award. So I think I can breathe now. This is, this is a little um, humbling, and I am so proud to, to be the recipient, for Philly Cam to be the recipient of this first award. And, as, and I want to thank Danielle and all the incredible organizers of Women in Media. Uh, we look forward to this event every year, and I am excited to just see more and more women and our, and our allies who are here in the audience, who are our, our members of the Philly Camp family. I accept the award on behalf of all of us. We're almost a thousand strong now in terms of our members, both uh, TV and, and radio producers and just supporters and, and people aspiring to, to make their own media. Uh, we really are committed 
to the same mission of, of using media to make an impact and, 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 and have more um, equity and, uh, and justice in our communities. And I, I really, um, I, I love what's on the shirts, uh, on the back of the shirts. You know, I know some of you could turn around, it's like, e <laughs> it's equip, empower, and encourage women. And I feel like That is something that is really at the core of what Philly Cam is. Just, I always like to know who's in the room. So, if, if you've heard of Philly Cam or a Philly Cam member, can you just raise your hand? I just want to see you. <laughs> because we um, really, you know, as, as 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 everyone was saying, you know, this this getting Philly Cam and getting public access to television was the result of a twice almost a 30 years grassroots struggle to finally convince. Um, elected officials and, and, and the cable companies that people having an opportunity, all the citizens of Philadelphia, all the residents of Philadelphia having an opportunity to express themselves and have access to high quality technology and cable channels was a right and that we, 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 we deserved it and we were paying cable bills and we should be getting something in return. So uh, we're still young in the, in the, in the world of, of public access television. Many cities have had it for 30 years and we're still only eight years in to our journey together. And now as uh, Danielle mentioned, we have added a low power FM radio station, WPPM 106.5 all platforms, online, radio, and cable TV, and we, this is an invitation to you, so if you have not come and visited us down at our station at, uh, on 7th Street in Center City, please come down, consider uh, taking a class, or just supporting the fact that we are, I believe, the, 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 one of the radio stations, television stations, that is most reflective of what this city Yes, looks and, and feels like and is kind of covering the issues and, and, and that, that we are, are dealing with because these are really challenging times that, that we are living in and it's more important than ever that we raise the voices of women and non-gender conforming people and all of our allies and those of people of color to speak truth to power and to counter all the misogyny and hatred that is going on. We also got the opportunity to interview the founder of the event, Danielle. So I'm here with Danielle, and she is the founder of Women in Media uh, Conference, and it is the fifth annual. Yes. So do you want to tell us what's um, a little different this year, what um, you kind of went above and beyond to really make this one stand out from the other ones? Sure. So our theme this year is advocacy and leadership. Be seen, be heard, be bold. And that's a different um, theme for us because we kind of married two different worlds. We're talking about media and leadership, but then we're also talking about advocacy. So how can you use your resources and multimedia tools to then spread the concerns and the issues of our community? So we're really pulling on the heartstrings and the leadership of our women in media to not only just, you know, do feel good stories, but let everybody know what's going on in our communities and how we can support and help. So that's different. Secondly, we had a world-renowned keynote speaker, like a legendary keynote speaker. So we went Wim Global this year, so we said, we have to have somebody who matches our swag, and Sonia Sanchez was perfect to have. We also gave out our second award, um, the Advocacy and Leadership Award. This is our first time doing that. So congratulations to Philly Cam on being the one and only recipients of the Advocacy and Leadership Awards. We also did a lot with the decorations. So, um, you know, we've continued to grow and so has our support. So I called up my florist and I said, hey, we got a little bit something to work with. Can you get us some cool decorations? So I love um, to create the atmosphere and just make it embody who we are and what we do and to, you know, have the women feel good. Um, another big thing that we did different this year is we engaged a production team. So we went from just three people working behind the scenes putting together something for many people to, hey, let's extend this and open this up to other women who have different skill sets they can bring to the table and actually get their hands in. So we had a whole production team and our team today is 18 strong. That's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so um, do you want to tell us about um, the start of the Women in Media Conference, why you thought it was important? You gave us a little in your speech. We'll just kind of dive deep into what inspired you to create this event. It was that very moment where I felt 
and saw with my own two eyes at 23 years old that women were still misrepresented. And um, I had just got home from Spelman College, so I was in the Mecca in the atmosphere that really embraced, encouraged, and empowered women to be exactly who we see ourselves as. And to go from there where we're like highly praised and sought after to back home to Philly, where you have a feature film about the art scene that is not a true story. So let's back up and talk about the filmmakers who did not create a story that was true. And I'm a historian. I went to school for history. I have a degree in African American studies and theater arts and dance. So secondary, primary sources, archives, all that is real. And I spent years living in the archives researching stories and researching facts. So their facts were off and I was offended. And um, I just, I, I left and I felt something in my spirit to do something to empower women, just to own your voice and to remember that even today, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, there's still a need for women to make sure that we're out there owning our voices and raising our concerns if we see an issue. And that's where it all started. I called on some other women in media who I felt had the same sentiments as me and my best friend, and they said, let's get started. Temple University came on board to sponsor, and we had tons of sponsors that year. I probably had like $300 in my account. And you know, it turned out to be something amazing. My mother supported and donated. And uh, we had Deanna Williams there. We had the late and great E. Stephen Collins. My awesome mentor was there. We had city representatives there. We had people from NBC and MTV there. We had students and you know, all the way up to seasoned professionals. And it was awesome. It was a half day conference. We put it together in less than 40 days and it was, it was successful. And from there, we started to get inquiries like, okay, what's next? What are y'all doing? But there was no next plan. It was just, let's do this event, remind women to own their voices, empower them, and that was it. You know, but when we started getting the responses, we sat back down at the table and said, it looks like we're onto something, let's move forward. So we decided to rebrand or come up with a whole new brand called Women in Media. And Women in Media is right here. So Women in Media was actually the name of the first event. And that was where, you know, we said, calling all women in media, come out to a workshop, own your voices, you know? Yes. And so what we do is empower, equip, and encourage women in media and women to own their voices. So. That's how, you know, we got started, and five years later, you know, it's, it's bigger than it ever was. Um, we got increased for Atlanta, Georgia, and we started Atlanta in June, and uh, the increase continued to come in. I had my first interview in Nigeria last Saturday. They said, you're having a conference in Philly? Can we interview you? You know, and I said, I would be happy to do that. So it's awesome. Um, this is just the beginning. It's, it's almost like, you know, you have your five-year-old who, is now having their backpack on and going to school. It has a little bit of responsibility to get on the bus and come back home and sit in class and listen to your teacher, you know? So we're five and it, it's not without community support and attendees that we are able to grow um, and to do this thing. So I love it. So do you have any um, last words for any women who are watching this and uh, are interested kind of in becoming a woman in the media and just don't know where to start? Yeah, so we, we get that often, you know, and it's great that we have been able to create a platform where we, can, we, where we can connect people and connect women. So we have high school students who attend, we have college students who attend, and then we have mid-level professionals and seasoned professionals. So what we do is create an atmosphere where mentorship can take place, where, you know, you can latch on or connect with someone who has wisdom to share. So you have those who have a lot to give and then you have those who are here to gain. And that's awesome. So I would encourage everybody to follow Women in Media at WIM Global, connect with us. We are going to continue to ramp up our programming. We have a website, womeninmediaglobal.org. And that's something new for five years. We have a website, <laughs> womeninmediaglobal.org. You can sign up for our newsletter there and we will continue to empower you, equip and encourage you to own your voice. We will have different activities that continue to go on throughout the United States. So just, you know, tap in and really push yourself out of your comfort zone to, to come. Because once you tap in, 
to the network, you know, you're going to get electrified and you're just going to love it. You're going to gain what you're coming to look for. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So that's Philly Cam here at Women in Media Conference. The conference also featured a panel of outstanding women in media. First of all, I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. It sounds kind of cliche, but it's really my pleasure to be here. I have been rolling out with women in media since the very beginning. Danielle, I am so proud of you. I am so impressed with you. Since the day I met you, I just, yeah, I have adopted her. She is officially my little sister, which is why I'm here today. Um, as well as I just love sisterhood and I love generations bringing the next generation forward. Me and Amber were just having that conversation. It's so important uh, that we do so, especially as women and especially as women in this country at this time. It's going to be a hard road for us, but together we're going to make everything happen that we want to happen. <laughs> Clap it up for sisterhood. That's right. Let's go. So we have a wonderful panel of women who are doing wonderful things with their lives, and I'm sure there's a lot of information in these brains right here that you guys are going to love and want and need in your life. So can we get started now? All right. So although I'm blind and Danielle wrote these questions out, and I love her, but she doesn't have the best penmanship, we're going to get through this together. Let's say good afternoon to Sarah Lomax Reese, to Terry Yago Ryan, to Miss Amber Noble Garland. Am I saying that right? Okay. And to Miss Helen Jim. All right. So, Sarah Lomax Reese. What was the inspiration behind Philadelphia's People of Color Meditation Group? Sure. That's a little bit of a curveball, because I usually am on these panels talking about radio, because um, I'm the president and CEO of WRD Radio, which is the yes. only, which is the only um, black talk radio station um, in the state of Pennsylvania. I, I wow. said black talk, OK? Sometimes, sometimes people say the only black radio station, black owned radio station. My family owns uh, WURD. We, uh, we purchased it in 2003. And I've been running it since um, 2010. So it's, uh, it's a real joy. But um, part of what keeps me sane in running uh, a radio station like WURD, because it's a, it's a real, um, it's a real grind because we have to compete with uh, a really diverse and dynamic mix of uh, radio stations in this market. This is a major market. And so we're an independently owned black talk station, so we're not music. And so it's, it's a real lift because a lot of um, other markets don't have black talk anymore. So um, we do a lot of community events. We do a lot of online and uh, radio stuff. So the People of Color Meditation Group um, was started, I'm a yoga teacher and practitioner. I, um, I, uh, I don't teach much anymore, actually. I'm kind of a retired yoga teacher. I teach very sporadically. But, um, but I was exposed to, to meditation through my yoga teacher training pro um, program. And um, about maybe six or seven years ago, me and another woman, Pamela Friedman, started a people of color meditation group. And we meet uh, once a month. Every, every month for about two hours and um, really try and cultivate this, uh, this mindfulness meditation practice, which really is probably the, that and yoga are the two things that are the most transformative practices in my life that help me to stay grounded, help me to stay focused, help me to understand humility and all of that stuff. So, um, so thanks for that question, because I usually don't get that, especially not as a first, uh, you know, first question. Okay, well, you can thank Danielle because I'm just reading what she gave me. <laughs> well, thank you, Danielle. <laughs> Ms. Terry Yagu Ryan, how important is freedom of expression for the youth in our community? Wow, awesome question. Again, thank Danielle. It is, thank you, Danielle. It is vitally important. So I spent the last 
uh, with the exception of the last year. I spent seven years running Big Picture Alliance. Big Picture Alliance is a youth media, digital media arts education organization. It's been around for 22 years. Uh, when I first started in my role, within the first month after meeting both stakeholders, uh, school partners, community and health organizational partners, I found myself thinking about how to describe Big Picture Alliance to anyone. And it connects right back to your question. So its work is grounded in being the intersection where youth and film and media learning intersect for change, for positive change. Youth voice is vitally important probably now. And I, I walked those streets and talked that talk and went and provided testimony at uh, the city council to make sure that arts funding was there to promote these programs. It is more important now than ever before. Um, and it was important then. So these kinds of programs that Big Picture Alliance runs and, and Philly Cam has now been developing their youth uh, arts program with Laura, wonderful Laura Deutsch who used to work at Big Picture Alliance. Um, these are safe havens, these programs that we run in schools or in after school programs. And I'm now on the board for Big Picture Alliance and continuing to talk wherever and whenever I can about the importance of youth voice. Great. Um, so hello ladies. I'm not going to say you guys because y'all are ladies. <laughs> um, and hello to the fellows who are in the room. My name is Amber Noble Garland. I'm so pleased to be here. Danielle, thank you so much for graciously inviting me to participate. I'm so excited and honored to be on this panel with these esteemed ladies and Lady B who I worked with for what, 20 years ago, and she is a living legend. So please give her a hand. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, boo. So um, <laughs> I, I started my career in media um, 27 years ago as a 10th grader at DAS, WDAS Radio. Um, went on to work um, at an executive level for a decade for Radio One, which is where B and I worked together, as well as some of the other major radio stations before they changed ownership a hundred times and became iHeart whatever. Um, and then I went on from there to uh, be recruited back to Radio One after I left and fell out of love and be, worked with them nationally with the Russ Parr Morning Show that was syndicated. I got recruited to Def Jam Records in 2001 and I was an executive um, marketing uh, brand manager for Jay-Z, LL Cool J, Patti LaBelle, the Isley Brothers, Lionel Richie, Dipset, um, Chrisette Michelle, and a host of other artists. And in 2001, at the, um, at the height of recession, I decided to take a leap of faith. And I quit my six-figure job to step out on faith, become my own boss on a full-time basis. I took my side hustles of being a talent manager and developing careers for um, nationally known radio and TV personalities like Egypt Sherrod, who you see on HGTV, who I managed for 18 years, Osei the Dark Secret, and other people. Um, and I went on to turn it into a full-fledged talent management business, which I retired from in December, and now have it as a consulting business. All right, good afternoon, ladies. Um, so I don't know if you can see me, but at least you're going to hear me. Um, so I'm Helen Gim. I am a mother of three kids, former public school teacher, and for the last two decades I've been an organizer in Philadelphia's Asian American immigrant and public education communities. So for a lot of my work for the 20 years, you know, we labor a lot on the margins of, of public life. I mean, um, we push towards the center. We're pushing hard in our communities. We're representing people who often have a ton of stereotypes about them, lots of biases, and we create policies out of that. And so my belief has always been that those policies don't change from the top, they happen from the bottom. And we've got to mobilize our parents, our women, our immigrant communities, our public education communities in a broad-based coalition to tackle huge money, big political interests, and go there and be unafraid and passionate in speaking about our present, our future, and our youth in particular. Um, and so we've done that. We've taken on big issues like the state takeover, the parking authority, and its failure to fund our public schools, and most other things that they're supposed to do in this city. Um, we challenged, you know, school districts to do better. We challenged the city to do better. And um, because of that, we started to turn around different narratives. And to me, whether you're involved with public education, criminal justice work, housing, 
and anti-poverty work, all of our work is very intersectional if we do it well and if we do it right. Um, and so this is part of, for me, it was a large part of a broader movement. And then in 2015, after looking at, um, after being real active in uh, taking on a gubernatorial race where we saw uh, the first one-term governor um, in Pennsylvania history go down largely because of his lack of support for public education, the municipal races came in and there was a discussion um, among a lot of communities about running a grassroots political campaign outside public and party support um, that would be driven on issues. And so I ran for city council at large, crisscrossed this city, had an amazing, um, engaging, passionate and powerful experience talking to people and being re-energized by our politics. And what I think that means right now is that this moment is so powerful for all of us that we have to be grassroots oriented and minded. We've got to be building coalitions. We've got to realize that our issues have to be intersecting and broadening in circular ways, um, not linear, and that women have to be at the forefront of a lot of this. So, um, so I'm here to soak all of this up and to be grateful for this company. And thank you, Danielle. So my story is a little bit different. I was in the first communications media business advertising side, then client side, I moved then over, and this is way, way, way back, I'm gonna age myself like a dinosaur. I was in the film and television business, so you might know um, and be more familiar with the products than perhaps the organizational names like Hemdale Film Corporation and MCEG Sterling. You might be more familiar with something like uh, NBC and Homicide Life on the Streets, which I uh, supervised the first season of and we won an Emmy and launched the careers for people like Yafit Koto and Andre Brower. And these, this is way, way back. I don't even know if y'all know. Have you heard of um, Homicide, anybody? Okay. So I've managed the UPN affiliate TV station back in California, ran film companies, also so took over management and ran, you know, companies like Canon Pictures, Delta Force. Anybody heard of Chuck Norris? Um, for a number of years, and you know, how was this crazy lady doing all this stuff before they, before I was 30? And I remember one day sitting up in our Century City office, up on Century Park East, and talking with a colleague of mine, and going, you know, we're not curing cancer; we're just making movies, and feeling like there's something more. And I didn't quite know what it was yet, uh, but what I knew was that at some point I'd figure that out. Um, I continued in both the film and television business for a while, also consulted to a number of media entities and sort of took a journey over to the Midwest after the birth of my first, I have two boys, and after the first, first child was born, kind of segued over and my, my husband's career took us to the Midwest where I still consulted back to LA in the film and, and television business, and this is way back before everybody was virtual, so um, it, was, it was fun um, convincing people that we could actually do this stuff that we do so naturally now, right? Um, and then ultimately made my way, and, and, and there while in the Midwest, I also consulted to some organizations and nonprofits that were doing really important work, both uh, down in the kind of southern area of the Midwest in Louisville, Kentucky, as well as then up in Michigan, and, and ended up on a board of an international children's film festival. And um, that was pretty exciting as well. When I moved out to Philadelphia, I think one of the first people I reached out to was Sharon Pinkinson, if you're familiar with the Greater Philadelphia Film um, Office, and we knew a lot of the same people from my past life in the film business, and who would think that quite a few years later she was on the board of Big Picture Alliance, and I reached out to her, I'm like, what is this Big Picture Alliance group? What is the work that they're doing? Now, I had consulted to a lot of nonprofits, both sat on boards and consulted to them in the Midwest, and she said, oh, you gotta find out more about this group, they're doing some really important work. So the bottom line is creating change for youth where their school systems are telling them that they don't have the opportunities and that they're not um, worthy of the same level of rigor in their English classes has now been changed because what we did at Big Picture was go into schools, both after school programs, some summer programs. We've partnered with Philadelphia Youth Network. We've partnered with many organizations. Bottom line, school change. Youth doing better in their English classes, one to two grade improvement, scoring higher on their spring benchmark exams. Media matters. Media makes a difference. It's how youth connect with each other and tell their stories. Well, the only thing I want to say is my career has always been about media ownership. I know that. Um, there is nothing more important. You know, the, the, the climate that we're in right now is 
so intense and the media is really standing in the gap between kind of a totalitarian regime and an, an, an infrastructure that is able to hold these elected officials accountable. And to me, ownership is so key. And so I want to just say that to the women who are here. Working at a media enterprise is great, but I want to challenge you to consider owning your own media outlet. Yes. Because, um, 90% of all of our media is owned by six companies. Six companies own 90% of all of our media. And I'm not talking even about Facebook and Twitter, and, but think about the control that that creates mm -hmm. in our country, in our society. The messages are totally, you go to other parts of the world and you see the news coverage that they do, it's completely different from what the, the same regurgitated stories that oftentimes mm -hmm. are, are um, kind of put forth here in, in America. So um, I published a magazine for 10 years, an African-American health magazine called HealthQuest. So that was kind of my foray. I'm a journalist by training. I, I uh, published this magazine, started in Atlanta, moved to Philly, and grew it to about a 500,000 circulation. It was a black consumer health magazine. The first one in the country was called HealthQuest, Total Wellness for Body, Mind, and Spirit. I stopped publishing that, and then I did my yoga and meditation stuff for about uh, five years. And then I got drawn back into radio because my family purchased WURD, like I said, in 2003. I did not want to work at WURD at all. I was committed to not working there. And I look never, what happened. I, I never wanted to work as hard as I had worked for my magazine ever again. I had three children, and I, I you know, was kind of an absentee parent, kind of. Um, but um, I got roped back into WURD because I saw that there was so much that could be done with that media property, even though it's an AM station. It was an AM station. We're now broadcast on AM and 900 AM and 96.1 FM. Um, Love it. And we've been able to just kind of transform it to a multimedia instead of just looking at this it as a small little, you know, um, stick, right, like AM station that really <laughs> had such a limited range. We were able to reconceptualize it and turn it into something that really provides a voice for black Philadelphia in a very, very important way. Talking about social justice, talking about political engagement, talking about economic and uh, development and wealth creation talking about health and wellness, education, all of the things. And I feel like we have been able to kind of create a, um, a, a media platform that really engages the African-American community, the people who are often voiceless yes. in this yes. city. Yes. And we require the stakeholders, the elected officials, the business community to engage and be accountable to our community, and that's what we're all about, and that's what I'm about in terms, and we can do that. I can stand up to, I don't want to start naming, well, unions and corporations and all these people, because we are independently owned. We can say things that you will not hear anywhere else, because when they come calling me, I have to stand up and just take it, because I'm empowered to do that. I'm empowered to do that. I don't have to run it up four layers. Nope. So, and that is story. the beauty about what you do, yes. All right, back to the questions, Ms. Amber. Advice for other women on their entrepreneurship journey. Hmm, great question. Um, advice for other women on their entrepreneurship journey. Well, one of the things that I, I say is that success is on my own terms, and it needs to be on your own terms. Oftentimes, we um, are validated by or we measure our success by what someone else is doing, right? And so I firmly believe that what God has designed for me and what God has designed for you may not be the same. So while I think it's important to have mentors and models, um, and like B said, she and I were just talking about this, to find people either in your own backyard, in your own bloodline, um, in your own classroom uh, or in your own workspace that you can look at them and say, you know what, she is bad. You know, when I grow up, I wanna be like her. Um, that is very important or to find virtual mentors, right? Like 
any of these ladies up here on this, on this um, platform, or Oprah, or whomever you, you know, deem to be um, someone who is worthy of emulating yourself after, you also need to take some of that pressure off of yourself and understand that everybody's not going to be Oprah. And everybody's not going to be Katie Couric. Like, you are great. Just who you are, where you are, you're more than enough. Give yourself time to develop. Uh, you know, don't put the bar up here, raise the bar really, really high, but make sure you do it on your own terms. Because what I've noticed in the almost 30 years that I've been working in media, whether it was me, you know, uh, interning with Patty Jackson and Ga Gary Shepard and sweet talking my way up, you know, or if it was me as an executive or leadership or now me as an entrepreneur calling my own shots, I've noticed that people often give up because it doesn't happen fast enough. Yeah, I am no 27 year overnight success. I've been grinding my butt off and that's a whole lot of booty. So <laughs> with that being said, I just say, don't give up, don't give in and don't measure where you are and where you have the potential to go necessarily by somebody else's walk because that's their walk. And like Sarah just said, I just talked to you about your father, right? I remember your magazine, right? I remember her magazine when I was a student at Temple, when I was working at WRTI, I didn't even mention that part, right? When it was jazz before the classical. I said that to say she went there, she came back, she ran away from it and it came calling her back. A different form of media, but media nonetheless. Right? And so she had to do it on her own terms. She had to go identify other things that she was passionate about and she found her purpose in her yoga teaching. But she also knew that she, there was a void that needed to be filled and she was brave enough and courageous enough to do it, but she had to do it on her own terms. No matter how much people probably were offering her jobs or saying, you could do this or you could do that. And I'm sure you got those phone calls because when I left radio and I was working at Channel 6 and doing a whole bunch of other stuff, I was getting phone calls. And when I left Def Jam, I was getting even more phone calls and people trying to throw money at me and do all kinds of stuff. But I knew that God had called me to do something else on my own terms. And I was going to step out on faith. So those aspiring female entrepreneurs, never be afraid to walk away from any relationship that doesn't serve you. If that's a job Amen. and it's not working for you, come up with your exit strategy and exit stage left. Right? But do it on your own terms. Be smart about it and do it your way. Okay. Well said, Amber. All right, Miss Ellen, since being seated in 2016, also being the first Asian American woman to serve on the Philadelphia City Council, can you touch base on how it felt? Um, I mean, I think it was, well, for me, one of the things when I first went in was to really think about the stories that we're going to tell. The, the, um, the fact of the matter is whenever you are a first in anything, and many of us uh, women in this room especially understand that, that you're going to either reinforce or break down stereotypes. And so, you know, it's not that hard, um, you know, to go in and start taking on those stereotypes. And that was a really big one. But the one most important thing I wanted to do, especially being in city council, joining five other women on council, was to start forming bonds with other women on council. This is something that I think women in power in particular have a big challenge about, that we have to really commit ourselves to being um, and supporting one another when we're in these spaces. It's a real easy game to go in and see each other as competition, to play off of other people. Um, and so it was real important when I came in to try to form this Women of Council kind of initiative. And that meant that we were explicit and articulate about taking on sexual harassment in the workplace, Love lead it. poisoning and the safety of our young people, pay equity, and then, um, and then to let the gentleman in the room know that we were doing that. Uh, <laughs> <I love it. laughs> that's the other real important part about all of this. You're not trying to do this in secret. Um, so, you know, we went in and tried to form this group, this Women of Council, and this has been a really good group when we can come together. And we don't always agree, and that's fine, but when we do come together, we make those bonds really clear, they're explicit, we let us know internally, we share, we talk about it, we support each other's successes, and then we go out there and do it. Um, so that was a very important aspect of it. And then, of course, I think the other really important aspect of being um, 
you know, taking on a lot of the issues and some of the things that we've been talking about up here. It has been a mission in my life to change the stories that impact policy. Um, I think that it's so difficult to change up these narratives that oppress, divide, silence, marginalize, condemn whole groups and classes of people right now. And I think Sarah's doing incredible work. I think all the women on this panel and in this room are doing incredible work. But it is a nonstop conscious act to take on narratives and to start to upend and change those. We've been very active on immigration, um, of course, you know, when the demon happens to come in orange hair and a bizarre, like, mic in front of them and rally white supremacists and neo-Nazis, it's really easy to say, oh, well, you know, the immigration issue, I see it differently. But we had a deportation machine before Donald Trump came into office. <laughs> That's right. And that deportation machine feeds a private for-profit prison industry that puts immigrant communities in very close alignment with other communities of color also struggling. So internally and externally, we are trying to change that narrative to be aggressive and deliberate and very politically conscious about it because we have to change the attitudes that uh, keep our own people back within the Asian American and immigrant community and prevent us from building alliances that will uh, help us build out a stronger medium. So a lot of my work is helping figure out how to create spaces, multi-racial, uh, multi-generational coalition building spaces so we can take on some of these hard issues that have plagued us for a long time. Wow, I am so glad you are representing. That's all I have to say. Okay, Sarah, next question. How important is self-care for you while being a successful media mogul? Hmm, okay, well, first, I self -care. don't, I I didn't don't come really up with define question. myself as a media mogul, but thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> um, self-care, I mean, I think that, that the, the reality is if you are not well, you're not going to be able to do the work at the maximum level that you need to do it. That's, you know, that, that is the bottom line. If you are, whether it's you're sleepy or you're sick or you're depressed or you're in a bad relationship or, you know, whatever, or your child is sick, so you feel sick, whatever is going on in your life, one of the things that I would say in terms of self-care is that a lot of times we as women try and segment our lives. Oh, I'm this way at work, I'm this way at home, I'm this way as a mother, I'm this way as a wife or whatever, a partner. But we need to really just be who we are everywhere we are and just own our, you know, the, the totality of, of, of our being and just completely um, step into that. And that's one of the things I love about aging, about getting older is I feel like, you know, um, I just am so much more myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. I feel um, very comfortable anywhere that I go. I don't care whether I'm, at, like yesterday I moderated a Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce panel discussion and today I'm here at a Women in Media, you know, uh, conference. And, you know, anywhere I go, I feel I'm supposed to be there. And to me, that's a matter of, of what I think of as divine order. You know, wherever I am is where I'm supposed, even if I don't want to be there, that's where I'm supposed to be at that I moment like in it. time. So, you know, one of the things in terms of self-care, and this is the last thing I'll say on this topic is, you know, the, 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 the thing about meditation and mindfulness is it cultivates your sense of being present, your sense of being in this moment right here, right now, because other, that's all we've got. And I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but a lot of times our minds are either in the past, we're like, you know, relitigating something somebody did on Twitter yesterday, which is kind of what, I, <laughs> kind of what I've been doing, um, or we're thinking about what we're doing next, you know, where I gotta be next, but we're not ever fully in this moment, and that's really all we have. That is all we have, so, you know, for, for us as women, I just think it's so important for us to breathe, to remember to kind of drop into this very, very precious moment and experience it and, and embrace it and just um, fully live it. So that's what I would say. Very good. 
All right, Terry, um, you basically already answered this question, but give us a little more. Explain your involvement with the Philadelphia Youth Media Collaborate. Oh, okay. Um, one of the founding mothers, I guess you could call it. So there were a group of us that came together, um, and I'm now trying to figure out how many years back this has been, because the Philadelphia Youth Media Collaborative's been around Goodness gracious, more than five years, six years at this point. Um, I know that I came together with Gretchen Klausing from Philly Cam, and goodness, Renee Hobbs at the time was at Temple University, if you're familiar with Renee's work. So there were a number of us who came together and said, um, a lot of people don't understand this work. A lot of people don't understand, I mean, a lot of people do, we have a lot of support from a lot of the local uh, private foundations, private money, public money. So there are stakeholders who get it. They get what we do. I remember being at a, a Pew, a Pew uh, gathering uh, where they were sharing some results of some research that they had done across the city around the arts, um, basically arts and schools initiatives. They talked about music, they talked about theater, they talked about the arts programs. No one could define media arts. A gentleman raised his hand, could have been a student at one of the film schools, I don't know, stood up and said, well, have you looked into the media arts programs at these schools? And I looked over at my board chair and I just said, we've got some work to do. We've got some work to do. So the collaborative came together both uh, with best practices in mind, a place and space where we could be sharing best practices with each other, really strengthening each other, each other uh, all of the organization's work, both as a collective, which will strengthen our voice around the importance and impact of this work, um, a place and space safe to share best practices and stories around our work, and hopefully, um, and I'm, I'm certain that we've done this work, a place and space where together and collectively we're strengthening our efforts to support youth in the city. Um, okay. Ms. Amber, yes. explain the benefits of maintaining healthy business relationships for a woman in media. Oh my goodness, wow. There, I mean, to me, relationships is the most um, valuable currency, right? So. You can have all the credit cards you want. Your FICO score can be whatever it is. Um, you can be uh, liquid with money in the bank. You can own stocks in Amazon, which I sold a long time ago, and I'm really pissed off about that, but I digress. <laughs> but relationships, <laughs> relationships are your greatest currency. You cannot put a price tag on it. Um, case in point, Danielle and I sat on a panel together uh, for Villa, right? Sneaker Villa, or what they call it, for ye years ago. And the connection that we had was, I knew the person who at the time was doing the organization of this. They were in charge of marketing, community engagement. She and I happened to be panelists at the same event. Um, I had moved to New York, obviously, some years ago, so I was in more North Jersey, but I'm a Philly girl, right? So. As I decided to, like I said, retire last year, I said, you know, I want to be very intentional and deliberate about reconnecting with things in, in my city. And when I would see Danielle at different events, she reminded me so much of me. On the ball, hustling, you know, I'm a lot older than her at this point, but we established a connection. And I actually followed up, she followed up with me and I dropped the ball, just keeping it 100 with you. But then I said, you know what, I need to be intentional because I see something in her, I wanna know what she's doing, I wanna pay it forward, and she also brings something to the table. So we reconnected, hence I am here. But had I not been intentional and deliberate and purposeful and thoughtful about creating a relationship with her and her doing the same with me, I wouldn't be sitting here. And I'll have to tell you, most of the moves that I made in my media career, whether it was radio, working in television, managing radio and TV talent, um, working with blogs and podcasts, and I've touched every probably area of media and now with literary, it all went back to who I connected with, right? That is your greatest currency. I, I'll start. Um, 
it's very, 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 very hard. <laughs> um, somebody said to me, you know, like, like I grew up in, I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of a, uh, I guess I, I matured in the, the 80s. Um, and so that was the era where women were like, you can have it all. You can have it all. You can have the, the crazy, like, executive career. You can have children. You can have, you know, and, and, and you should want, you should go for it. You should have it all. And so that was, like, my mindset. And then somebody said, yeah, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and that's, yeah. that's for real. And, yeah. and so all, the, the advice that I would give is... Um, just know that it's not going to be easy. Have a support network, you know. Hopefully you have family because family is probably the best kind of um, network. But a lot of times, you know, like, like either your family is not around or they're engaged in other things. So you have to figure out how you're going to create your village of support that's going to allow you to actualize and do the things that you want to do from a career standpoint but also have the support that you're gonna need as a mother for your children and, and for yourself. Because, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of guilt that can come along with, with parenting um, and, and going for your career. But also know yourself, you know, know thyself is, is another like adage. Because some women were, you know, like when I was raising my children, I would see women who were stay at home moms and I'd be like, oh gosh, I wish I could do that. And then I was, I did stay at home and I was like, this is not for me. This is not for me. So it's like, you know, make peace with whatever decisions you make and create the network and infrastructure and, and village that you need to actualize what you want your life to be. That's what I would say. So I just wanted to uh, first thank this uh, young woman Mother, thank you so much um, for all your work that you're doing. Um, I don't have too much more to add, you know, for myself. I think it's hard to, I mean, I don't, I, it's, it's almost impossible for me to see like an equal balance and share. I think there's a give and take on different levels at different things. Sometimes it is all about, you got to have your space for yourself. Um, sometimes you're giving more to your children. Sometimes you're giving more to your partner. Sometimes you're giving more to your work, but to, believe that there's some kind of perfect equal balance that's moving at any given point in time is a fantasy that I think a lot of us women cannot be held prisoner to. Um, men are selfish to ungodly ends. Um, Sorry, and women, women need to realize that that point of selfishness can also apply to us. Um, the one thing that I would always say that no matter what space I was in, whether I got paid for it or I didn't, there's a need for you to develop who you are as an individual, spiritually, professionally, politically. But um, if you cannot find the perfect job, um, then make sure that whatever you're doing on your volunteer time is honing all of that with you. If you cannot find um, you know, that perfect space where you're with your children more, um, then you need to be developing that perfect thing outside. Then spend your time with your children. I brought a lot of my kids with me at a lot of the events for me. Yes, yes, for, and, and it's different. I mean, obviously being like an activist and community activism, but I believe in propaganda for my children. <laughs> Uh, because someone else is giving it to them if I'm not. So I wanted my children to be in political spaces, to go to the lectures. Mother, Mom's got to go to this professional thing. You're going to sit over here, and we're going to do this as a family. So some of us have the luxury of doing that. Some of us try to figure out how to do that. But um, how you're working it out is, is all you, and I'm, I'm fully supportive. Yes. Yes. Snap, snap for that. Um, I love and, and co-sign on everything that these ladies said, and I want to also give you some additional takeaways, too. So, um, first and foremost, for me, when my, when my house is right, my home is right, then my mind is right. If that's in a disarray, then I can't even function and think straight. So I do try to make it a priority to, um, to make that the second thing. The first thing I'm going to make sure is right is me, because self-care is the best health care. Right? So what I realized was when I became a mom, I, I, I fell into this notion that it's, it's got to be all about the baby, and then the husband is feeling neglected, and it's the baby, and it's the husband. It's like, okay, well, where do I fit into this situation? So I was walking around looking a little crazy. Hair was not coiffed, 
okay? And I was not right, I wasn't myself. So take care of yourself first and foremost. Take care of your family, you know, if that's your child or your, your household, second of all. Um, but, but also to get creative. Think about if you're not already an entrepreneur, think about what you can do in a consulting capacity from home. Drop my God, Jesus. <laughs> Faith. Uh, I think I said it earlier, yoga and meditation are my grounding forces. I would say the same, uh, yoga, uh, making some quiet time to just be and try to just clear everything else out and just have that time to be quiet and still. Quiet time running um, for me and uh, time with, with my, my kids. So they're pretty amazing individuals. They're getting older now and adults and just hearing them and getting out of my life, um, getting out of my head, out of my problems and pouring it into somebody else is, is actually very powerful. Can I just I, I just want to piggyback on that because I think that having like really good friends, yeah. you know, yes. like like that right. um, that the, the people who like know you, oh, yeah. who you can yeah. be, however, you know, you don't have to be fabulous. You can cry. You can, you know. You yeah, can it's always good play. to have a sister that you can pull out a box of tissues with. Yeah, you know, you know yeah. having that having that yeah. that network of friends um, is so is so um, healing and rejuvenating and important, particularly when you're really busy so that you can just be who you really are with the people that know you best and love you no matter what. And I can add on by saying, sis, you might call it a storm, and I know it sounds very redundant and very cliche, but the sun will come out tomorrow. So hold on to faith, girl, hold on to faith. All right. Hello. Um, I'm in my first year as being station manager at Philly Cam. <laughs> Good luck! And because Philly Cam is popular, I'm being drowned in email, voicemails, text messages, social media. How do you all manage um, communications, stay on top of it, and, and getting back to people who, who want to get involved with what you're doing? I would say... Mm. Get you some, get you some good interns. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> interns are the best. No, seriously. You know what? I know, I know people who are adults and they're trying to start over and they need to switch to a new career, so they got to pay dues. There is complete value in internships. So, if you don't have the overhead budget for to pay all of these a million assistants, get you some great support. Let them learn because obviously you know something. You're the station manager, so they can learn from you. And I would say. Um, YouTube, like when I need to figure something out, whether it's organizational or how, YouTube has videos for everything. Make YouTube your best friend. And if all else fails, go to hiremymom.com. I'm not, I'm not connected to them, but I'm telling you, I found Is this like, your website? Ever? I swear, I swear it's not. I swear it's not. I just thought it was, when people come up with smart ideas, like I'm just that person, I'm going, I don't even have to know you. I'm just like, that was smart. I wish I would have thought of it. I'm going to promote it because I realized I needed a virtual assistant and because I was so used to an assistant being right there, I was not connecting with it. Hey, there's somebody probably with like two kids and a husband or whatever who knows how to run a house, which is like running a corporation and she's looking for work. Maybe I need to hire her. So I had to get out of my head and say, I'm drowning in these emails. I'm not calling people back and now they're getting irate. I need to figure it out. So find a support staff and interns, intern, interns. Use them. Uh, two line email. Um, mine is like, you know, I just let people, you can even put a little thing on the bottom. This email is not meant to be rude. It's meant to be efficient. Um, so you just respond, you know, one or two words and then whatever you committed to do and then you're out. Um, but I think that for me personally, I get like so caught up in email and responding mm. and like that. No one cares. They just, for me, what they mostly need is an answer and a response. A decision has to be made. So I got to make those decisions. So I'm like very clear. I'm not trying to be rude. Just trying to be efficient. Here's your answer. 
got to go. Um, and, you know, to some extent, like, I try to be, uh, you know, I think that people appreciate just getting to the point, um, and I think we should just wean ourselves off of the email. You really want to have a conversation with me, pick up the phone and call, yep. um, and then we can do that way. But email, just get it out of the way. Um, ditto, ditto, but what I would add to this is, um, and I forget where I read this, but be efficient with your time, right? And so it, you're not gonna go on social media all day long, it's just gonna break up in your day and it's gonna wreak more havoc than you know what to do with. So it's about prioritizing, which you probably already know because of the position you're in, but also really segmenting your time in, a, in, the, in the best and most smart, efficient way you can, right? So if you're only gonna be checking this social media or you're only gonna allocate this much time to your emails at this part of the day because you've got all these other priorities and then you're gonna go back and you're gonna check them a little later in the day. I know that sound, might sound crazy to some of you, okay? I mean, I'm remembering back in the day that's like aging me, but does anybody remember when it was like, oh, well, I gotta answer Calling. that phone call <laughs> within 24 hours or I'm gonna answer that email within 12 hours or I'm gonna answer that email within six hours. So it's prioritizing your emails and those responses. And then the rest, yes, a quick response when you can. But you've got to make sure that you're hitting your other priorities. And yes, more interns. Do you have Drexel ones? OK, good. Yeah, everybody, all those Drexel ones are fantastic. You get 30 hours, and you don't have to pay them. It's wonderful. They can't do what you're doing. No, they can't. Can, of course. Can, can I say something real quick? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Sometimes I think we, we, because we're control freaks, some of us, I'm not saying you, I'm just saying me, right? Yeah. So sometimes we, we labor over the things that we could really yeah. delegate. Yeah. And I had to learn and am still learning to delegate because of my type A personality, right? Just some things you don't, you're the boss. You need to be the boss chick and deal with the higher level macro things that really require your expertise and your brilliance. And you need to delegate some of those things to the people who are coming up in the ranks who can at least buy you some time until you can get to them. Yeah, Sarah. trust them. That's a mind shift. Sure. That's just shifting your trust mind Trust them. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I think that um, the pace that we're living in at, the pace of, of work is, is unsustainable right. and unrealistic. Yeah. And um, so, you know, one thing, and somebody emailed this to me, you have to forgive yourself on, on some level for not being able to stay on top of everything. Because it's, it's, it's almost impossible, the, the, the speed and everything. I mean, I wake up, if, if I wake up at five o'clock in the morning, I got like, you know, a whole slew of emails that came in over, overnight. So it's, it's um, you have to kind of recognize that the level of expectation that we're operating at is, is kind of unrealistic. And so, you know, like, like so for me, I say to people, if you email me, if you want something from me, don't be mad if I don't get right back to you. You gotta be persistent. People have gotta email me a few times because it may get lost in the shuffle. And I feel the same way. I forgive other people. Yeah. Yeah. If they don't get right back to me, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna email them again and again and again. Because I know that the, the pace that we're operating at is, is just frantic and it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And so I don't get offended if people don't respond right back to me, and therefore I hope that people don't get offended when, if I don't respond right back to them. But I think that you have to kind of strike that balance and realize that you know, you're not gonna be able to, to, to respond to everything instantaneously. And just kind of work, you know, trying to figure out your pace. That's, that's, that's reasonable and healthy and, and doable. Yeah.